Thank you, David. Thank you all of you for coming out today. Thank you, B&H. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, it's quite an honor to share the stage with so many accomplished photographers here at Optic. And I know that a lot of the photographers that you've seen yesterday and today and we'll see later today are all about traveling to these incredible destinations and photographing these amuse uh, amazing places, uh, a lot of times places that you'll never get the opportunity to go to. And while their photos are great, maybe you don't really have the chance to go out and make photos like that yourself. Um, so today, when I knew I was coming here to Optic, I wanted to focus on backyard macro. And everything you'll see in this presentation today of mine was shot in my own yard at my own house in Pennsylvania. And everything that I explain, there's going to be a lot of uh, technical stuff, but really small bite-sized chunks. So if you're not the most technical person, it should still be really easy to understand. So there's the topics today. A lot to fit into a short time. I know we're already behind, um, but I think I can get through it pretty quickly. We have about 30 minutes together today. And uh, again, I really wanted everything to be high impact, lots of takeaways. So if you've got your camera with you on your lap, if you've got your cell phone in your pocket, I think that taking photos of some of the slides, especially toward the end, that's where I'm going to give my top 10 tips for macro. Uh, a lot of good things that you can put into use right away. And actually, there's a macro set up outside with some uh, fake bugs and flowers and things. And you could actually apply some of these techniques right away. So 10 seconds about me. Grew up in New Jersey, not far from here. I live in Pennsylvania now. I started shooting film about 25 years ago, developing black and white. And then for about the last six or seven years, I've been focused mostly on insects and spiders. So why macro? When first people learn that I like to photograph insects and spiders, and they see my work, they say, why the heck would you photograph insects and spiders? You know, they're gross, they're weird, they're scary. Um, and I didn't set out initially to photograph arthropods. I bought a macro lens, I liked the detail, I liked the abstract macros I saw, and the more I got into it, the more I started to appreciate the detail and the discovery and the interaction with these subjects. And that whole concept of I can just go out in my backyard and crawl around on the ground or look in the flowers and find something that I had no idea was there, that's pretty incredible. So why might you want to shoot macro? Um, so there's lots of reasons I could go on and on and give a whole presentation about why I think everyone should shoot macro and that it's the best genre. But really, these two points, mastering the photography basics and developing your patience. So even if you like to photograph landscapes or portraits or weddings or you know, larger wildlife or anything else, um, you really need a lot of patience. And the patience required for macro is transferable to all of those other genres. Also, just mastering the basics, there is no room for error with macro, right? Things are magnified, you see every mistake. If you're not making mistakes with macro, you will not make mistakes with the big stuff. All right, I know everyone wants to see gear. They always want to know what I use, what camera, you know. Oh, that's a great photo. What gear do you use, right? That's the biggest complimentary insult we can get. So here it is. So I'm going to pick it up here. I've got my rig. When I go out in the field, this is it. This is all I bring with me. I have some other things. You go on my website and look into other gear that I use from time to time. But 90% of the time, it's right here. So what is this in my hand? I have the OM System OM1. So that's, uh, if you're familiar with Olympus, Olympus had a name change recently. The first flagship camera is the OM-1. Super compact, weather sealed, uh, lots of computational features, amazing image stabilization. Uh, and I just love that I can hold the whole rig in one hand and I can kind of navigate my scene with the other. And again, with being weather sealed, I never have to worry. Speaking of weather sealed, there's my lens, the Emsweco 60 millimeter f2.8 macro. Very, very small, very, very light. It's about three inches long. It yields a one-to-one -one magnification. I'm gonna get into that in a few minutes. If you don't understand what that means, I will hopefully demystify it for you. Um, but it's a macro lens, and it's a really, really great quality macro lens. And as a 60 millimeter f2.8 prime, it also does a pretty good job with portraits. So, uh, you know, if you can go from the field into the studio, it works pretty well. And then I'm almost always shooting with flash. 
Now you may be familiar with different macro flashes. There's some outside here. There's ring lights and uh, there's adjustable flashes that you can connect to the end of the lens barrel. All kinds of different things. I use a traditional speed light. This is the Olympus FL700WR. I use it mounted on the hot shoe. Uh, some people say, oh no, you need off camera flash for macro. And that's fine, I can do that with this flash, but I prefer to just diffuse the flash on the hot shoe uh, and shoot like that. It keeps my left hand free. A lot of times I'm crawling around on the ground, I'm moving branches away. Uh, so that's what's best for me. And then once in a while, this is not a macro lens, this is a telephoto lens. Uh, this is the 40 to 150 Pro, but it is weather sealed, it is very compact for what it is, and it has really good close working distance, so I can focus from about three feet away with this lens. I'm not gonna get that full magnification like I would with a macro lens, but I do get about a 0.25x magnification. It's really good for larger insects that are a little bit more skittish, butterflies, dragonflies, that sort of thing. All right, so now when I held up my camera, you may have noticed this hood over the camera. That's my diffuser. It's really, really important, especially since insects and spiders are often very reflective, to diffuse your light. I'm gonna show an example in a minute, but by diffusing the light, we eliminate the dark shadows, the bright hot spots, give nice even lighting. Think of this as a very tiny, up really close portrait like you would shoot in the studio. And that's the Cygnus Tech diffuser. That's uh, handmade by a guy in Australia. He sells them directly. If you wanna make your own, I have uh, made several of my own and there's an example there. And then this is Completely no cost. This is pulled out of you know, some shipment that came to my house. It's packing foam, and it actually does a great job. Not quite as great as the Cygnus Tech diffuser, not quite as great as some other options out there, but really inexpensive way, uh, and you just use an elastic band to fix that to the end of your lens, shoot your light through that, and you're gonna soften everything up. And then two more pieces of equipment that I like to use. I'll get into this a little bit in a few minutes. The Raynox DCR250, that's a super macro lens converter. It's essentially a fancy magnifying glass that clips over your lens, and you can use it on any lens. I use it on my macro lens to get a little bit more magnification for those really uh, cooperative subjects or the super, super tiny ones. Uh, there are some drawbacks, but I'll explain that further in a little bit. And then extension tubes, this is something else you may be pretty familiar with, very common way to get more macro out of a lens by going behind the lens, extension tubes move the lens element further from the sensor and therefore magnify the image on the sensor. And you can use extension tubes with pretty much any lens from any system, but with macro lens, they're just going to make it more magnified. All right, on the subject of magnification, if you don't know what one-to-one -one is, hopefully this helps you understand. So if you look at the bottom, we have the one-to-one -one uncropped result on a full-frame system camera. That's about a 36 millimeter, 35, 36 millimeter sensor, an APS-C sensor, and then micro four-thirds, a four-third sensor, which is what my OM system camera has. So you can see that maybe you're familiar with crop factor, like on telephoto, right? Like, oh, the full-frame equivalent is this for my APS-C or micro four-thirds. Well, with macro, it works similarly where on full frame, I'm getting one-to-one -one with the pennies or, you know, they look a little more zoomed out effectively, right? But on four-thirds, micro four-thirds, you're getting a closer look. So effectively, I'm getting a 2x magnification out of my one-to-one -one lens, which is actually an advantage and one of the reasons why I prefer to shoot with the micro four-thirds system for macro is macro is all about magnification, right? So I'm getting 100% additional magnification out of the one-to-one -one lens. And there's just a comparison uh, on micro four thirds, what you would see one to four, one to two, one to 1.3, and one to one. And when we talk about those numbers, the first number is the size of the subject in real life, and the second number is the size on the sensor. So a penny is about 19 millimeters across, my sensor is about 17 and a half millimeters across, and as you can see, when I'm at one to one, I get almost the entire penny in view, 
because it is the same size in real life as it is on my sensor. And then those two uh, options, the Raynox DCR250 and extension tubes, if you do want more magnification, this is the impact that they'll have, right? So we have our base on the left, that's my 60 macro, that's what I can get, that's as close as it will produce in focus. Then the center image, that's with the 60 macro plus the Raynox DCR250. And then on the right is the 60 macro plus extension tubes. And as you can see, they're really similar results, uh, almost the exact same field of view with one versus the other. But I prefer the Raynox because when I'm in the field, I can pop it on and off. With extension tubes, I have to take off my lens, I have to put them on, I have to put the lens back on, shoot, oh, I didn't get what I want, I have to take it apart. With the Raynox, I can just pop it on and off. If you know that you want that extra magnification for all of the shots in the session that you're working with, then extension tubes are just fine. So a little bit of a preference, but that's my rationale. So now, speaking of uh, depth of field and magnification, we're gonna move into aperture. I think that we have a pretty, you know, educated room here, accomplished photographers. We know what aperture is. We know that it's the size of the hole that the light's coming through into our sensor. And we know that it affects depth of field. We all know that these uh, fast primes, 1.8, 1.2 primes, they're gonna give us that beautiful soft background, right? But with macro, you very rarely find a macro image shot at 2.8 or 1.8. Uh, and that's because of working distance. And when we get super close, all the images I'm about to show are shot within four inches of my subject. So when I move close, the depth of field reduces dramatically, okay? And so I have a couple of illustrations of that here. So here's a water droplet on the end of a blade of grass. This is shot at f2.8. It's barely in focus at all. Almost nothing is in focus about it. You've got great bokeh in the background, really soft, beautiful, creamy color, but the water drop really isn't even in focus. But then we go to F8, the subject is in focus. The background is still pleasing as far as the softness of it. And then we go up to F16. Now the background does get a little bit distracting, but you're guaranteeing that everything is in focus, okay? So I just show this so everyone understands that subject to lens distance or subject to sensor distance really impacts how much is in focus, um, way more than you might think if you're coming from a different genre of photography. And then the same example here with a mushroom, just that front edge in focus. Now just about the entire cap. And then everything, but again, as you get up you know, small aperture f16, you do introduce a little bit more distraction into the background. So you have to keep that in mind if you want to shoot at those small apertures. Now we're going to talk a little bit about lighting. Lighting is essential to any photograph. We all know that. Um, with macro, because you're so close to the subject and a lot of times you're in the woods or you're, you know, under something, there's very little available light in the field. Um, now, sometimes you're out in midday, you're out in, in a field in tall grass, and there may be good sunlight, but it might not be the light that you want. So I really rely on that speed light flash to light my subjects. And here I've got three examples. This is a dead fly, so you know, not the most beautiful subject. But you can see how on the left, we've got no flash. One one-hundredth of a second, F2.8. And again, at F2.8, Hardly anything's in focus. Also, really contrasty, right? The available light was giving me a lot of contrast. And my ISO had to be up at 800. So that's gonna start to introduce noise the higher the ISO goes. In the center, I use the flash. So it's better. It's a little bit more in focus, but really contrasty because that flash is hitting the shiny parts of the subject. And then I bring in a diffuser. And the, the shadows come back, the highlights come back, everything starts to flatten out and you get a more appealing visual. And on the two with the flash, you notice that my ISO is now down to uh, ISO 200. Now I want to talk about black backgrounds. I added this just for you guys today because I was thinking what questions do people always ask me 
about my photos. And one is when I have a photo with a black background, people tend to think that it was shot at night or that it's shot on something black, right? Like I have a black backdrop card that I bring around with me. And that's not the case. Uh, you can make black backgrounds during the day. If you're familiar with the inverse square law or uh, maybe more simply the concept of flash fall off, that's how I'm getting a black background. My light source is super close to my subject the light is hitting the subject and then quickly falling off behind the subject. So if there's no background, no, uh, no elements in the background near my subject, this was shot at one o'clock in the afternoon on a sunny day, but there's nothing behind that fern. So my light from my flash is hitting nothing and falling off and therefore giving me a black background. Now you may like this, you may like the dramatic effect of it, and that's how you accomplish it. But also, what if it's happening and you don't want it? Well, you can bring something behind your subject. This was shot 10 seconds later by holding a yellow piece of paper about 18 inches behind my subject. Same exact settings, but now my flash is hitting something of color. And in a real world situation, I would pick up a leaf off of the ground or something of color, you know, anything nearby, it's totally defocused, but you get some color in. Or maybe there's flowers and you kind of bend one into the scene to get that extra background. And there's with more of a purple color behind. And then that's the natural background. So I slow my shutter speed a bit. This is at 1 60th of a second. I'm still using a flash to fill. Opened up the aperture a tiny bit and I'm getting some of that distant color, just a little bit of green in the background. Just to give a little bit of natural context. All right, now the other thing everybody wants to know is what camera you used and what are your settings, right? So they can just buy that camera and put in those settings and they'll get photos just like you. I mean, we all know that that's exactly how it works. So there's the mic. Um, so here's my settings. Nothing complicated. Uh, I consider these baseline settings. This is where I start. I have uh, custom modes on my camera. You may have custom modes on your camera. Every manufacturer, they're a little bit different. On my mode dial at C1, and these are my preset baseline settings for C1. I have my shooting mode set to behave as manual, uh, 1 100th of a second shutter speed, f2.8, ISO 200, single point AF, and I'll talk about uh, autofocus and manual focus in a second. Focus type manual. Drive mode is at five frames per second. Now, my camera is capable of 120 frames per second stills at full resolution. But A, I don't need that for this type of shooting. B, I'm shooting with a flash. My flash cannot keep up at 120 frames a second, right? So I slow it down, five frames a second. My flash can recycle, keep up with that, uh, and still gives me good sequences. Live view mode, this is simulated optical viewfinder. Uh, the key here is whatever camera you have, don't use a what you see, what you get live view use something that's going to brighten the screen. So it might be called Live View Boost, it might be called Night Vision, whatever it's called for your camera, you want to brighten the exposure that is in the preview, but let your exposure happen based on your settings and your flash. Uh, we don't need face and eye detection, we're shooting in RAW, white balance I have set to auto, picture mode is natural, image stabilization is on, on auto, and uh, Olympus cameras have something called Keep Warm Color, by default is on. I like the look of it off. And then I also map some buttons. So if you're into customizing your gear, this can be a great way to get the features that you really like at your fingertips for when you need them. So we're gonna get into focus bracketing and focus stacking next. I have both of them mapped to buttons, right? So if I'm shooting a subject and it's cooperative, I think, okay, I can go for something a little bit more here. Maybe I wanna focus stack, click of a button, now I'm focus stacking. Uh, focus peaking is helpful for securing focus. Same thing with focus assistance magnification on the back. Uh, that pushes my view in, so I get a closer view of what I'm focusing on, so I really know the things are in focus. Um, and I think that's everything that I have mapped to a button, right? Oh, and then the, Viewfinder, if I want that, what you see is what you get. I can just toggle that on and off. Speaking of focus stacking and bracketing, uh, if you've never heard these terms before, 
I'm just going to give you a definition, introduction to them, because I feel like it's important when you're talking about macro to explain these topics. If you have heard them, maybe you're not sure what they are, or use them interchangeably, just think of it as you can bracket without stacking. You cannot stack without bracketing. Okay? So bracketing is just like with exposure or aperture. Bracketing means taking a series of images with varied settings in sequence, right? So I'm taking a series of images where the focus varies from shot to shot, typically from front to back. So I'm focusing on the front plane, then moving back, moving back, further and further through my bracketed series. And then focus stacking is taking the bracketed series and blending the in-focus areas together, either in post with software like Helicon Focus or Photoshop, or Zarine Stacker, or with some cameras, like the camera that I use, you can actually do it in camera, which is awesome. So you press the button once, it takes a bracketed series, there's a little loading bar that comes across the screen, and it spits out a focus stack JPEG. Uh, you do keep all the RAWs, though, just in case you want them for later. So why would you do that? Um, really, because, as I mentioned earlier, depth of field is so minimal with macro, you might need multiple shots to get enough depth of field to have your subject in focus the way you want it. Um, so that's really the main reason. It also lets you keep the beautiful soft background that you get from the wide apertures, but still have enough depth of field. So you're getting like the best of both worlds. Now I know the question that people are asking is, well, why wouldn't I just use a small aperture? I can go f16 or f22. Um, you could. You get more in focus. We probably all know that. This is an example shot at f16. But you also get distractions. You get things that are in focus that maybe you don't want in focus. Um, you also run the risk of introducing diffraction, where your image is actually starting to soften at those small apertures. But if you focus stack, We've got 12 images shot at f4. Now just the crocus, the flower, is really in focus. Some blades of grass directly under, but everything else is soft, okay? So you really just keep the areas in focus that you want. Everything else is soft. And one more example. This is more of a real world example of what I like to shoot. So this is a polished lady beetle, 12 images. Probably hard to see the difference in focus, but top left, we're focused on the front of the face. Bottom right, focused inside that little curled leaf. And then there's the result. Okay, so nice and sharp for the entire subject, but everything else soft, no distractions. And into sample photos. So. All we have left are sample photos and then those 10 tips, and hopefully you'll get your real takeaways there. So first up, jumping spider. Every macro photographer shoots live subjects, loves jumping spiders. I mean, they're adorable, they have big eyes, they're fun to work with, they have tons of personality. Um, so definitely one of my favorites. So that's a single frame shot, no stacking there. This is a six frame focus stack shot. So I used the automatic bracketing feature in camera, and then I stacked with helic and focus in post. Um, but as you can see here, from the very front of the fly, all the way back to where the wings attach to the body, everything's in focus, nothing else is. Here we've got a honeybee coming in for a landing. Incredibly difficult to shoot insects in flight. I will not claim that is my specialty, but I was proud to get this one. Uh, I saw the bees coming in on the crocuses. I think it was at the same time that I shot the previous example. And I said, okay, if I am patient enough and I set my focus on the crocus, I know that there's going to be a bee coming in and I'm going to get it. Uh, and I ended up with a few that were in focus, but this was the one that I really liked the most. Just a little bit of motion blur on the wings, uh, the pollen on the face coming in. Uh, of course, this is a single frame shot, no stacking in flight. Uh, I've seen it done a couple of times, but I think there's some sort of magic going on. But this is uh, a single shot. Wolf spider, uh, this is actually an expecting mother. If you look way back in the background, you can see that kind of white orb. So wolf spiders carry their 
uh, unborn babies in an egg sack behind them. So I found this, I think my wife found this actually, in the backyard. She called me out and said, you know, go do what you gotta do. And <laughs> there's, a, there's a wolf spider, but that's a 30 frame stack. So that's a pretty deep stack for me, the way that I shoot. But she was pretty cooperative. Um, I started out with single shots, then some deeper bracketed series and said, okay, I think I'm gonna really go for it here and was fortunate to get this. This is a furrow bee. So this is shot straight down a piece of bristle grass. So that's the tall grass with like the kind of fluffy seeds at the top. And I'm shooting directly down. And this is not in flight. A lot of people thought this shot was in flight. It's just really tiny and suspended on the bristles. Um, but it gives this really dramatic sense, almost like there's like a firework going off behind the bee. Uh, and then that dramatic black background, which I talked about earlier. Here's a stink bug. If you're from the Northeast, you probably know these guys. Uh, kind of infamous. Reasonably harmless, but pretty annoying. They get in your house, come in the windows. Um, they're a great subject if you're a beginning macro shooter because they don't move a lot. The, you know, they're pretty tolerant. You can get close to them. You can kind of poke and prod them. Uh, they can fly, but they'll probably hang out. So really great practice. Um, and this was a stack as well. This was done in camera. So I set my camera to automatically bracket and automatically stack, and this was the resulting JPEG that came out of camera. Another favorite subject, praying mantis. I could watch praying mantises for hours. You know, they're like aliens in our bushes. They're incredible. They're also a great macro subject because their face is really flat. So they're giving you a flat plane. So if you can get your lens parallel to their face, then you get everything in focus. Um, I did stack, I think, two frames here, but that was just to get that kind of crest of the head in focus. Um, but you can really achieve quite a bit with a single frame image on a mantis, even though they're a large subject because their face is so flat. So speaking of getting things in focus, incredibly difficult scene. So people are always surprised, like, what do you, you know, come across in the field there? This happens a lot. This is going on all around us. And it's really difficult to get two subjects in focus at the same time. So my tip for that is to shoot them from profile. These are obviously shot from more of a frontal, a little bit three quarter view. But I was able to come up a little bit and shoot slightly down to get both the male and female lady beetle uh, in the same focal plane. And this is done with a single shot. So no stacking required. Uh, and it's really difficult because they're moving a lot. And then my last sample image before I get into tips, robber fly, another favorite. Robber flies are fascinating kind of uh, just voracious feeders and hunters. And the color of that green bottle fly in contrast with the white background and kind of the muted colors of the robber fly in combination with all the detail from the fly's body and then the robber fly's eyes being you know, so large and the bristles in its face. Um, but when subjects are feeding, really great because they tend to not move all that much. So when you want cooperation and you want to shoot multiple frames for a stack series, feeding insect is kind of a captive audience. They just want to eat their meal and go about their business. You go in, you go slowly, and you can walk away with shots like this. All right, on to the tips. This is the home stretch, just a few minutes left. Tip number one. You've heard it in other presentations today. You probably heard it in presentations yesterday. Be patient. If you're shooting live subjects, even if you're working with inanimate macro subjects, you really have to be perfect, and you are not going to be perfect without patience, right? Be obsessive about your focus. Be calm when you're approaching your subject. Go very slowly, slow down. You're gonna find more subjects. You're gonna get more shots that you're happy with. On that same topic, approach slowly. When you go in, you, you find a subject, you're like, oh, there's that robber fly eating that I heard about. I want to get a photo like Chris showed me at Optic. Well, don't rush in. They can still fly. They can still run away, right? Go very slowly. Take a shot, inch closer. Take another shot, inch closer. Sometimes it's a shot on the way in that's better than you had in your mind for that high magnification shot. Get low. Getting down to a vantage point 
that's unfamiliar to people is a way to create interest in your photos. We're not used to seeing subjects from their level. Most people aren't crawling around on the ground with a magnifying glass every day, right? So maybe I am, but most people aren't. So when you show them a subject in a new way, that's more interesting. And conversely, if you just shoot from straight down, right, like looking down, that's how we're used to seeing bugs. We see them from our level, you know, five, six feet off the ground, we look down, they're crawling around. That's not as interesting. So think about interesting ways, and getting low is one way to do that. Soften your light. Talked about that a couple of times already. Diffusing your light. This again kind of employs getting low. That face-to-face -face view, nice soft light. Ladybugs, lady beetles, very shiny, very difficult to manage the light. But here you see no real hot spots, pretty even, uh, and it gives you a pleasing result. So this is the surprising one for a lot of people. We're talking about macro, we're talking about magnification, we're talking about getting close, pull back, okay? Pull back for a couple of reasons. One, you're not gonna scare your subject. Two, sometimes it can be really frustrating to go in so close and, and miss shots. You're scaring them, you're uh, getting shots that are out of focus. Back up. Relax. It helps you kind of recenter yourself, and sometimes you end up with shots that you're really happy with. When you do go in close, aim for the eyes, especially if it's an insect, has really interesting compound eyes. Dragonflies have 30,000 facets in their eyes. We want to see those, right? That's the detail that we're going for. But don't just aim for the eyes. Aim for the front plane of the eyes. Because if you miss that front plane, those segments that are closest to your lens, your shot is really ruined, okay? So it's similar to a portrait where if the eyes are out of focus, the portrait's ruined. Well, the front plane of the eyes and an insect needs to be in focus or that shot can be ruined. Seven out of 10, mind the background. The background is part of your composition, okay? Unless you're super, super tight, and that whole entire frame is filled with an insect or a spider's face, pay attention to the background. Here, I shot this fly from a couple different angles. It was reasonably cooperative. I saw that leaf in the background kind of mirroring that shape in the foreground. I get these diagonal lines going back and forth. I said, oh, I can just move just a little bit and I'm gonna have a better shot. Utilize focusing tools. The two most popular that I recommend and do use both are focus peaking and focus magnification. So I mentioned focus magnification earlier. I use it constantly. That pushes in my view so I can really see what's in focus. And then focus peaking, if you're unfamiliar, that highlights uh, in a color, oftentimes it's default of red in most cameras. It highlights the edges of your subject that are in focus so you get visual feedback that guarantees what you think is in focus actually is in focus. Shoot in small bursts. So I told you that I use a five frames per second burst rate. Very rarely am I clicking the shutter one time, right? I'm clicking and holding. I'm slightly moving in and out, acquiring focus. My subjects are moving. So even though I'm trying to get my shot on that first click, I'll let a few extra fly and hope that if I missed it on the first one, maybe I got on that second or third one. You know, we're using digital cameras, we have big memory cards, those shots are free, use them to your advantage. And then last but not least, if you like macro, buy a good macro lens, right? Tip your toes into the water, you know, use a Raynox, use extension tubes, uh, use a lens that's maybe not quite as capable but nothing is a substitute for a good macro lens that's capable of close focus and high magnification. Um, it really pays off. And that's it.